Hello, welcome to In A Conversation With, brought to you by After The 90. So today I'm sat here with Libby Emerson of Back On Site. Libby, thanks a million for taking the time to chat to us this Hello, evening. Thank you for having um, me. We're here to find out a bit about your charity that's gone from strength to strength. Week on week, I'm checking out new partnerships and it's gone from, you know, hearing about one person to hearing about rugby clubs and football clubs and it's all gone from strength to strength. But um, I suppose the first question that, you know, we want to ask is where did it all begin for for back on side what you know what happened that made you think right this is something that I need to put everything I have into um kind of two reasons really it started off that my son was getting really badly bullied at the school and had been since oh god primary five I think four or five although he'll say it's earlier he'll say it's primary three yeah um and we we'd moved him schools we'd tried all different types of things with them and then eventually went to high school and it continued and it got worse. Right. And his passion was football. He loved football. He played in a, yeah. in a, a team in the, in the local village um, and eventually it got to a stage where he just he didn't want to do it anymore. He'd lost... Lost his passion for Lost the, his passion, game, yeah, yeah. But not just for football, for everything, but, mm-hmm. but football was the only thing that would get him out of the house and would drive him. Because the bullies were in the team, and the team was run by um, dads. Ah, right, yeah. yeah um, they... I, will, I will stop you there and say that <laughs> um, a couple of my a couple of good friends of mine have had experiences with, you know, clubs that are teams that are run by parents, and obviously have sometimes the parents put their kids at the front, yeah. leave the rest at the back. It, it, it still happens to this day. It's it's not it's no secret that that. And it was supposed that to be a. Um, a rolling, so every child would get a shot on. Yeah. And That's how it should be. I mean, the early game for kids should never be about, okay, it should be competitive, but at the same time, I've had conversations with people and I don't think anyone hasn't agreed that up to a certain age, children should just play football for the enjoyment of yeah, it, learn exactly. about the game, develop their game, you know, and not worry about trophies or medals to a certain age because, you know, instilling that in them at an early age is, believe it or not, such a mental pressure on them. You know, but anyway. Yeah, so, and it got to the stage where he was always saying, Mum, I'm not getting picked, and, and I would speak to the parents, and yeah. they would excuse after excuse, but then their kids would be on, and they wouldn't be any better than Jack. So, yeah. eventually, with the bullying issue in the, in, the, in the club as well as the school, he just decided that he was giving it up, and there was nothing I could do to um, change his mind. And then it continued, and he got very suicidal. We had to get the police involved. He was assaulted in school. He, it's, the list goes on. And yeah. eventually it wasn't until he was really suicidal that, that people started to listen at the school. Right. Um, it was always, I was just always told that it was settling in periods. But when you got to fourth year, it was like, come on, we've been here four years now. Yeah. Um, and something quite dramatic happened with him. Mm-hmm. That the police were involved and that's been... They started to listen. So I decided that I wanted to try and... Because it's all about education and it's all about the children understanding the effect that they've got on other kids. And I believe if a child is bullying someone, there's an issue. He's not. There's obviously a reason why he's bullying somebody. So we need to educate and help them as well. As much as I'm a mum and seeing what the kids are doing to them. You can't really... Yeah, it's it's very hard. But I do actually believe that that there's, there's obviously a problem with their home life or or maybe they're getting bullied and their way to deal with it is to, yeah. to be the bully. And that was always my concern with Jack was that he would turn out to be a bully because he's been bullied. But thankfully, we've educated him well enough that he now understands that that's not mm-hmm. how it goes. And he's very involved in back on side and he wants to go out and speak to different schools, which I think is fantastic. Yeah. Um, There's nothing better than, obviously you were saying that sometimes it turn out to be a bully if they're being bullied mm-hmm. themselves. I think the biggest difference between that happening with others is that you've educated. That's yeah. that's the focal point is that you've educated, you know, your son to know that you don't have to do that for it to be a coping mechanism that's exactly. happening to you. And that happens to so many kids. But no, I'll 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 come straight out. You you've probably seen my, my video on Facebook that mm-hmm. I, I put up. i I'm very open about my experiences and what happened to me. I was like your son, bullied right the way through school. Um, I myself, again, very suicidal, stuff happened, uh, almost a mirror image of what your son went through. My mother 
and father knew nothing about it. You know, it, they, they didn't know anything until about, I'd say, two or three years ago. You know, it was completely blanked because I didn't want to be a burden to people. Um, and even up, in, up into my work life, unfortunately, I got a, a full-time job, but the general manager was putting all the blame of everything on me, even when it wasn't my fault. Mm -hmm. And that just shot me to the ground. I was self-harming while working, which is, yeah. you know, now that I look back on it, I think, you know, Jesus Christ, I, I've actually took time out of my working day to go and do that because I just couldn't handle, you know, work anymore. But obviously, you've got rent, you've got yeah. things to pay for, so it's kind of like, you know, no, caught I, I between... Was, I was bullied at school. You know. um, I left school into third year, beginning the fourth year due to bullying, and, and I never ever told my parents until well, a couple of years yeah. ago as well. Um, so I'm very passionate about getting into school and educating. So that's what we, we ended up we wrote a programme for Backland Side and that's how it started. It never started off as a charity, it started off as a programme right. to go into schools and to work with um, the school would then pick what students mm -hmm. that were maybe underperforming yeah. or not attending or were bullies and mixing them in with the people who were bullying so we could then make that team work together and see, mm -hmm. they would both see the effect that they're having on each other. So we launched it in 2017 at a golf day um, with the press. And John McGinn was there, Charlie Adam, Barry Ferguson, loads. So we got a lot of press attention. And as soon as it went to press, we were inundated with calls of need of support. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I was completely unaware of my mental health I was struggling. Mm -hmm. So I'd left a job in 2016 and it wasn't an easy decision. There was a lot of um, kind of to and fro in and lawyers involved, etc. Mm -hmm. And I was still kind of going through this in 2017, plus dealing with trying to cope with Jack and where his headspace was. And then in 2000, September 2017, um, yeah, I pretty much couldn't cope with things anymore. And I'm not going to go into it, mm -hmm. obviously. No, no, you don't. That's absolutely fine. Um, but a, a footballer saved my life. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realised the issues with mental health in football yeah. after speaking to him and another footballer came forward or ex-footballer actually came forward um, and put me into private counselling yeah. and that, that's what saved me so from that kind of day on I decided that People I had to throw everything, of... everything into the yeah. side and um, put the brakes on of what we were trying to do it was Barry Ferguson said you, you need to get this into charity so that's what I started doing, and so the process went through um, of doing that. And in January 2018, it was registered as a charity. And to be honest, I've just been working quietly away in the background, if not yeah. really, because I've still had to. I lost all my confidence mm -hmm. over the last few years for numerous reasons, um, and I had to find that again. And I, I suppose, I, in a way, I still am trying to find that. Yeah. I don't take praise very well. I don't mm -hmm. think what I'm doing is anything special. Um, so when people praise me, I find it very strange. Yeah. Um, I, I personally, I'm the exact same. I've had people kind of, when people give me compliments or, or, or praise me on stuff that I'm doing, yeah, I find it very awkward. I don't know how to deal yeah. with praise. So I, I personally, I know exactly how you're, how you feel when that comes up because I haven't a clue. I just sit back and go, I, I, you know what? Thanks very much. No, so I don't even get to that stage. I'm like. Oh, I, what did I do? I mean, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? You don't you don't know what you've done. And, you know, people come and compliment you and I'm sitting there blank face going, I, I don't know how to react to this. It's yeah, yeah. it's almost like a strange emotion that you're feeling for the first time. That's what it feels like. But I, I'm sure I'm not the only one to say that. I'm glad that he did come forward and save your life because without that, we wouldn't have back on site. No, that, you know what I mean? That and, is very true. That you know, I, true. I'm sure I'm not the only person who's going to turn around and, and say the same thing. You know what I mean? But... Um, you've suffered, you know, in the, in the beginning of it because a lot of people walk into their jobs every day and stuff gets on, on their shoulders and they overwhelm themselves. It's so easy for it to happen. It just takes a day, you know, for it to happen. I think the reason that mental health has been, has been such a stigma around it is because we came from decades like the 80s and 90s where it was literally a man-up culture. Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to break down is, is getting rid of that. Yeah. And one of the areas that, you know, that culture was predominant was football. 
sports in general, rugby, football, no matter what you were into, it was always don't talk about it. Yeah. Don't talk about it. You'll get blacklisted. You get pushed out, this, that, and the other. And your organization is most definitely kind of changing the tide on that. It's trying and it's, it's working. Because like, so. you, like you said, you've got players like um, John McGinn involved, ex-players like Barry Ferguson and things like that. They're big names. And having those big names attached means people are listening. You know, sometimes, it, you know, I, I've gone out with this podcast countless times and, you know, even the video that I put on Facebook, it did reach a certain amount of people. But sometimes you just need someone to endorse it to get the message out there. And I'm delighted that it's, it's you know, pushed back on side straight up the, the ladder. But, you know, sorry, carry on. It's, it's, it's hard it. because we can uh, really disclose a lot of what we do. Mm. Um, so it's hard to try and get it across just how much we do and how many people support without I'm, ve I'm very very um, I think because of what I've been through my trust circle is very very small yeah. so I don't trust many people mm -hmm. so to have so many people trust me with their problems is um, it's an honour and it's also something that I'm very very careful and protective about mm -hmm. um, but the football world is definitely we, we're working just now or have over the last kind of six to eight months with 72 SPL players. Wow. Um, not, I mean, they're not all in one-to-one -one counselling or need anything like that. No, no, they, they them, don't have to. No, you know, they a really lot don't. Of them just need to, to offload or to, to hear that what they're feeling is, is normal and just to, to have somebody else to talk to. But that takes them a lot, I mean, to build up that trust to make mm. that move to, yeah. to message me or to phone me or whatever. Um, and on top of that, we're working with junior clubs, amateur clubs, Academies um, and the general public, so it's it's a lot to take on. Yeah, it's yeah. much as we're. I think everybody seems to think we're focused on football. Yeah, we're not. No, um, but that helped but that push is, the message out yeah. there. That's the, the that's kind of biggest, boat that you're yeah. you're but, sailing at the minute. Yeah, our biggest kind of impact is within football, and that's the we were we're finding most people are coming from, and I think that's to do with having the Gary O'Connor speak out. Um, having the support of John McGinn, Charlie Adam, etc., is it, it kind of lets people or the, the players see that if they're involved or if they're speaking out, mm -hmm. then then we're, a, we're obviously a trustworthy charity to work yeah. with them. So, yeah, I mean, uh, you don't have, we understand you can't, you don't disclose much information no. about what you do. Totally understand that. I mean, you have to trust the confidentiality of the people that you deal with at the end of the day. But um, as far as events go on, your golf day was a massive, massive success. Can you tell us a little bit about <coughs> how that went and who was involved and just yeah. generally, you know, the overall vibe on the day? Golf day, our golf day is mostly used for um, promotion of mm -hmm. who we are and that we're there rather than trying to make money, yeah. if that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, no, this year we, we did a lot of um, media interviews around it, one being with Gary O'Connor. Um, which really stepped up uh, the kind of interest of players contacting us. I mean, he didn't he didn't do a huge interview, but what he did do was more than enough to let people know that everybody struggles and and footballers are human. And that's I think that's a frustrating thing for me because I work so closely with with players and hear what their struggles are and what their worries are. People don't. People just see, oh, they, they get paid this amount of money, and so they should be grateful, and they should just accept that they're going to have mental health problems, or they should just go on with it and man up. That it's, money comes with a price. Yeah, it comes with a, a huge price. Um, and the, people need to remember that when they're when they're going home, that they can't leave um, their job behind because it follows them everywhere. It follows them even to the shops. Unfortunately. I just want to touch on that because it's a very good point. You know, in the even in the nineties and and you know late nineties or early two thousands, they could in a way leave it at work, but now because of social media, you just can't. You're followed everywhere. You know, you put out a tweet, people are wondering where you are, what you're doing now. You, it's almost as if it's not just on the pitch. You're living a, a twenty four hour media life. You know, yeah. you can't go anywhere. And I remember. Um, you know, seeing snippets of articles on Raheem Sterling and, and how the media portrays him compared to a non-coloured player, mm -hmm. for example, is absolutely atrocious. 
you know, they're, they're talking about the, this. He went out and bought his mother a house, and they're, you know, the article stated that, you know, Raheem Sterling splashes the cash or whatever on in the newspaper. But, you know, the same guy, same guy did it. Um, I think it was a Liverpool player. And he did the same thing. The only difference was his skin colour. But they were calling him grateful. And he did this for his parents and things like that. That's almost like you can't do anything without somebody judging exactly what you're doing. And people need to understand that. The only difference between me and Harry Kane is, well, one, he's taller. And two, he's fantastic with a football and he's not got a gut like I have. But... Again, you know, we're all people at the end of the day. He's we still all have the same, same struggles. Yeah, he's still got the same issues at home. He's still got family members that are maybe not well. Or no, he's got the same just, struggles as yeah. everyone else. And that's something that, you know, really infuriates me. But people need to understand, especially, you know, there's a lot of football fans out there who are diehard and expect so much from these players. And that's just one group of fans. Then you go onto social media where it's a, a club like Liverpool or Tottenham or Arsenal, any club in the Premier League, or even the SPFL and Celtic or Rangers, you've got a global fan base. We have to deal with millions of people who are expecting you to bang in 20 goals a season or have so many clean sheets. And it's just every day is the same. It's just inundated. And, and people need to realise that what you do and the pressure you put these players under, does, it does have an effect. And it's not always a positive one. You know what I mean? They're, they're people. They've got... You know, Lloyds have bad days. I mean, that's the other thing. If, if mental strength is the exact yeah. same as everyone else, so it's not any different. So and they're, ex- they're expected to perform even off the pitch. If it's for selfies or for constant messages, can you do this? Can you do that? And as soon as they say no to one, it's it's oh, they're how dare they? And they've got no right. They should be grateful that we're asking for their picture. But maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe something's going on in their life that they, they don't have the time, or they just generally don't feel up to doing it and people don't understand that and it's, it's heartbreaking I mean listen to some of their stories and how they're feeling yeah it's 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 really really sad that us as fans and human beings don't appreciate what they're going through yeah. and not just footballers rugby players rugby's another all. another um another organization that was massive in the in the man yeah. culture and the bullying culture that was in the in the we the worked with a lot of rugby players as well it was like, rife in the in the 90s and 2000s it was absolutely rife the whole bullying bullying culture and not even that but initiations and hazing and all this crap that you mm-hmm. you hear about what's the point now you know what i mean and that was rife in the 90s and 2000s for rugby especially at a community level and um, i know a, a rugby player that played for a good few years in community clubs and the stuff that he told me that he's seen that new players coming in and players that have, you know, spoken out about their mental health have gone through, it makes me sick to my stomach. Mm. You know, I won't even I won't even mention the stuff that, that went on, but you're talking about in some cases, you know, sexual abuse in these commu- community clubs, not even professional. You're talking the ro- the local rugby club down the road. I mean, it's absolutely insane, but you know, with what you've experienced from, you know, community clubs and, and rugby nowadays, which has improved massively, um how are you getting along with, with working with them and, and being involved? Um, now, I think we, we have a great relationship with a lot of clubs. Um, Hibs being one of them, Aberdeen, part of Thistle, Hamilton, Motherwell. I mean, they're all, they're all amazing, and especially junior clubs. We have a fantastic relationship with junior clubs. Um, and it's good to see now that we have a lot of managers and coaches that will approach us and ask, like, ask for advice or help um, and want to help the players. It's not just about players coming to you. It's about managers yeah. wanting to improve yeah. the players. Um, so that's a that's brilliant to see. Mm-hmm. Not all clubs are no. are that way inclined. But um, what was your first kind of step into the rugby side of things like? Um, I mean, obviously you're not Fraser Brown. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was he works. He does work with us really closely. Um, and he he came forward and told his his story when we launched with. Um, still in county and since then we've had a few rugby clubs come forward but just now it's it's about manpower yeah. <laughs> I just don't have it to, um, to yeah. get round every day just now so it's about prioritising most important clubs not most important clubs that's not the most important the amount of people that need help yeah. or um, if there's managers contacted us and said we've got concerns of certain players but yeah. so we have to kind of work it that way um, but no rugby is we, female rugby as well we, yeah. we work close with them and that's another thing female, women's, women's, women's clubs football, football, football well. clubs um, yeah. it's another one that you know obviously gets sometimes can get pushed out of the radar because 
oh, it's girls' clubs, they're fine. You if know, I, they I don't would... have the volatility of, of a men's club. And believe me, mm. I have coached women's yeah. football. And let me tell you, it's... I think the difference with women is, I mean, there's probably just the same amount of mental health in women. There is. But the there... difference is they ask a lot quicker and they do it. So say, for instance, players normally, I can have a, a player would contact me say one day and then the next day oh just forget I messaged it doesn't matter just forget yeah. that I didn't mean it and then it's up to me to then just kind of persevere because like, yeah. there's obviously a reason why they have there is of course um, and eventually they'll say yeah okay I do need help or I just need someone to talk to or whatever girls straight away I need help there's, there's no so they're, they're there's no backtracking yeah. it's just straightforward I've said it now I need to yeah. so they're, they're, they're progressed forward yeah. a lot quicker whereas guys it's yeah it's, it's kind of yeah. Easing out them. You know. from, from my experience, they put so much pressure on themselves as well. Like it's, it's almost as if they expect as much from themselves as, the, as sometimes the fans do. Mm-hmm. I find that the passion is almost doubled. You know what I mean? They have such a, they have such a, a passion not for, for just for the game, but for how well they're doing, and so, you know, it, it, it can impact on their yeah. mental health severely. But even like I know a few guys, well, a lot of guys. <laughs> mental, but I know a few that came out. And said, and our patron for one of them, David Cox, he um, was very open about his mental health, and he still gets abuse about it from fans, from opposite players, and it's horrific. I mean, what he has to listen to, and his partner has to listen to, when she's over, like, are we watching him? It's just, it's not acceptable, and that annoys me about clubs because they should be stepping in and doing something like that, yeah. um, just the way they do when it's racist comments or whatever. Um, yeah, but. Yeah, so they have that, I suppose players also have that fear of seeing other players coming out and talking about mental health and not always getting, not the support from their teammates or their clubs, but the fans and the opposite fans, because it's something else that they can throw at them. Um, and but females, it's, it's, it's different. I don't know why. I don't know why it's different. Maybe we're a bit more softer and, and kind-hearted. I don't know. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's just as bad in, in females as yeah, it is. It is male but females definitely ask for the help sooner so maybe they don't get to the stage where it comes to a crisis point mm. or we don't have that a lot of guys will say to me I, I'm embarrassed I shouldn't cry folk will laugh at me I feel worthless girls don't really have that they have mm. well, love Prob- them crying. Uh, the, the, I think the main problem is again men are afraid to do it because of the impact that it may have. I mean, you've got ex-players who have, you know, in one case, you know, it's probably the worst one I've, I've done is, is a, an ex-footballer who tried to kill himself and, and a fan literally wrote on social media or actually said to him from the stands, I can't remember which one it was, oh, if you're going to do it again, do it right next time. You're talking about David Cox? It could be. I'm not, yeah, yeah, I, I apologise, well, I'm not, that, I'm I not totally David's... clued up with with. Um, with uh, David Cox, I have heard of him, yeah, yeah. but um, I didn't know whether that was the same example, but I thought that was absolutely atrocious. No, David's had that, but David's you know, also had that from ridiculous. opposite team. team why, why do you think that is? I mean, I don't understand what... what I, I try to understand myself, you know, what is going through their minds when they're saying this stuff. I mean... Uh, honestly, it's a lack of education. Yeah. I really do. I think it's just... But people become different when you go to a football match. I don't know why. But <laughs> do you I think, think it's like a mob mentality type of thing? Do you think it's just an environmental thing where they, they walk out of the stadium and all of a sudden it's wiped clean from the slate and they I never said people, it or they never did it? People say that. People say that. I, think, I, I don't think that's an excuse. I, don't think, I think no. if you're educated properly, something like that would never come out of your yeah. mouth. You would never say that to somebody. Um, so, yeah, I think it has a lot to do with education and they don't realise the impact that that has on that player mm-hmm. or that person when they go home because they... They're, all, they're then constantly thinking what that person said. And that person's been home enjoying his Friday night or Saturday night and forgotten what he's shouted. But that's now living with that player until the next time. So when he goes back to the football mm. the next week, you probably find that they would try and not touch the ball because they don't want... They don't want that. They don't want to hear that abuse. abuse. So they'll, they'll, it'll change the whole game. Yeah. Um, and what do you think clubs need to do more of um, to combat this? Because... We've obviously had a massive, um, you know, exposure of racist abuse in the stands. Okay, still, um, still, which happening. is still there. You know, we've had the whole Bulgaria fiasco, yeah. you know, with England players and and their fans last night. Um, but what you know, 
a fan chanting something racist is, is horrible. But a fan chanting for a player to go kill himself is just as bad in my book. Yeah, you know, it, of course it is. It's just as bad. You you're literally could have, uh, you know, you're a party to someone's eventual death. You know, that is almost, if not worse, than what you're hearing coming from the stands from a racist standpoint. As, if if, I'm, if I'm honest, it's on, it's on a Yeah, it's exactly the par. same because you don't know the impact that then has on a, on a, like a racist comment to a black player, what that impact's yeah. going to have when they go home. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, these two are on a par, yeah, as far as I'm concerned. I think they should be treated you know, the same, and they should be, I personally think they should, be, I think they should be caught and they should be banned for life. Yeah. Because if that was, if that was one their, of their member family, exactly. it's just they, about to say, yeah. they wouldn't like it. Um, or, I, I, I don't know, it's, it's impossible to do, but <laughs> it would be, these people should be sat down and, and taught and you know, uh, educated yeah. about it and, yeah. and hear what the effect it has, maybe not face to face, but maybe on a screen or something, but hear yeah. how, depending on how serious it is, but hear how the impact that that has on these people's lives. I um, mean, you're not just saying that to, you know, a person of, of colour. You're not just saying it to them. You you say it to them, and you, you know, what if their family is of the same colour? You, mm-hmm. You're basically tarnishing their entire family, and it's it's atrocious. But I mean, from back on side's point of view, you know, I'm sure you want to stamp out the stigma on mental health. Full stop. Definitely. And from a fan standpoint, and you know, coming from the stands and screaming things like that. I don't. If I heard it, no doubt at Easter Road, the first thing I would do is 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 find the right person, you know, steward or whatever, and make them aware of it because it it doesn't belong in a, in a football ground. But going forward for back on side, what's your what's the the future and plans? And obviously, you know, so you, you've <laughs> you know you've got so, obviously you've got so many, but it's hard um, because what's happened is um, we're we're growing in all different directions because. Every person who comes to us gets something a different, different issue, a different mm-hmm. problem that we have to try and uh, adapt to and, and work with. But our main thing is um, obviously getting into clubs and, and educating, educating, yeah, supporting fans as well. Like our drop ins that we have at the clubs are not really for the players at all because they're for, they're for fans yeah. and the communities. Um, players we do completely separate and. But we'll no doubt, you know, if you let us know about that, we'll yeah. have no doubt about pushing that out on, on social media and just Facebook currently and change Instagram them all just and things now. like that. No, yeah. that's fine. Um, um, but you let us know about that and we'll no doubt, like, like you know, other organisations yeah. will push that out and let people know that there is a, a drop-in and, and mm. things like that for back on side. And also um, working with the academy, so the club's academy players as well, and also the first teams, because what, what I'm finding is that the professional players that are coming to us, it's about the fear of getting dropped if they go to their, their clubs or their teammates and it gets out. Because what people don't under or realise, I think, is as much as they're they're, also, they're fighting against their teammates for a position, those are like what you've got one or two or three goalkeepers, you've got how many strikers, they're constantly, as much as their teammates, they're still in competition. Mm-hmm. So to then, for some reason, they think that if they were to highlight that they are struggling mentally, that's a, they're just all oh, getting off the pitch or they're not strong enough, but actually the best place for them is on the pitch. So our job really is to to help them, to give them cope, like coping mechanisms or tools to, to help them or to get them to build a, a, enough trust that they trust us to get them professional support or even talk to their managers for them and, and work yeah. with them. And that is actually working really well. We, we work really closely with a few managers now but there's a few clubs that I think don't realise because we, we don't name MD I, I would never contact a manager no. No, no. and say such and such has approached us no. it's different if the manager phones me but then the yeah, players made of aware of that because the manager then mm-hmm. goes to the player but um, what we need clubs and managers etc to realise is that again 72 SPFL players have come to us that's a that's that's huge to me. That's a large yeah. number. You know, I, I understand how many players are are in the SPFL you know, across all the leagues, but nonetheless, for seventy two to come forward. On the flip side, I'm delighted they have. You oh, know, yeah, no, I'm delighted that you know your organisation is there to help them because a lot of people, you know, 
I tend to think that these things are only available to the public. They're not. You know, I mean, your organization is available to Anybody. anyone. Mm -hmm. And the fact that 72 players have come forward, for me, it's great to see because, it's, you know, you've yeah. made a difference in their lives. Being able to have that outlet and obviously having the discretion and things is, is very important. But That's um, massive. That's a huge thing. Of course it is. Thing. Of course and, it is. But what I need managers to understand is that a lot of them will see to us, oh, it's fine for our first teams because they, they've they got all the help that they need here. But yes, every club does have great support for, for mental health. But what is happening is the players, some of the players, not all the players, but some of the players that are struggling want to come completely away from football to get support because it's that fear of, mm. of, of getting get out judged or, or something, somebody something saying something. Yeah. yeah. So it's to try and get all the clubs to realise that we are there to work with them, not like, and everything again is free of charge. We, we, we cover all costs. Um, so there's doesn't matter if somebody's getting paid a fortune to somebody getting paid. There's, yeah, it's the same across the board. Yeah, everybody gets cheated. And that's that's an equality that's to me is very important because again, yeah, okay, they may be a footballer, they may be earning a lot of money, but does it make them any different from you know your next door neighbour? Does it? Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we're all human. And the thing is, that footballers that's earning this money still have the same pressures because they're. And it's, yes, it's their choice to live that lifestyle, but they are. Of course, I would, if I was on a really high wage, you would, you would live that lifestyle. You would live to the means yeah. that you're, you're, you're given. Yeah. And then you get bad advice. So they maybe do something that's bad advice in it. And they've got the general public just constantly mm. like, trying to, to tell so them. so careful. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's just... Yeah, I, mean, I wish I could like, just shout <laughs> about some of the, the things no, that people no, have to go through, um, but it's just I would no never, way. Um, um, I would never ask you to, to do that. The no, discretion I, I, is uh, something that I ultimately respect uh, without a shadow of a doubt. And, um, and I think that's why it's, it's, we are, like, it only really is me. There's, there's me and two trustees, but they don't even ask any details of who, who yeah. contacts me. Um, and our counsellor, if they get passed on to one of our professional counsellors, they're the only ones that, mm. that know anything. And even that, we don't ask, or I don't ask for any feedback unless there's a, a concern for life. Um, so yeah, we're very, very proud of that. You mentioned that your your inner so your trust circle is quite small, obviously within for yeah. good reason. Um, would you you know going forward, you know, are you considering kind of reaching out to others to help you? Because obviously you know it's get, it's doing so well at the minute. You know, for me personally, I'd hate to see you get Too, overburdened yeah. with, with things, but you know. Is yeah, that what no, you're, no. Are you looking for volunteers going forward to help out, or you know? It's hard because we we do get a lot of people saying they want to volunteer, but it's very hard to um, for for certain things to be volunteered. I, I could never get volunteers to work with people that approach us for support because it, it's all about trust, and we get a lot of people asking um, if we contact you, who is it, who runs your social media, who does this. So it's very important everybody knows it's just me that's in charge of yeah. all of that. Um, Volunteers, yes, going forward, maybe for events and things, but yeah. but we have to be really careful because this is people's lives. Yeah. We're working with this isn't just somebody having a bad day and needing to, to vent. You will get people at that, but this yeah. ultimately this is people's lives that we're dealing with, so it has to be mm -hmm. the right trained people that, well, that work. Does yeah. that make sense? There was an organisation that, that, you know, without I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. But it's an organisation called Pite House back in Dublin. Well, back in Ireland, they've expanded massively and, you know, have new residences. It's basically a, a clinic. It's just a house mm -hmm. that people can walk into any time of the day and, you know, if they're in trouble. And what they do, I think, is they get um, psychiatrists who don't take a wage or yeah. take a, a fee from it. And uh, different psychiatrists are there different days, but they see the same people over and over. Uh, the thing that impressed me was they see so many people, but they're in training at the minute. So they they help people, they don't get paid for it. Yeah. But at the same time, it's helping them, you know, learn yeah. from different experiences. Um, and that's just a, a thought that popped into my head there. So it's something that maybe you could look into yeah. or reach out and, and yeah, get some advice from them because every time I've reached out to them, they've gotten back and mm -hmm. given me advice on, you know, I've done the Edinburgh Marathon, you know, raise money for them. It's not even in Scotland, but I did it anyway. Yeah. Um and they provided me with everything, and I, you know, I was just thinking to myself, maybe that's something you could no, get advice on, look into, it and take some of the burden off mm -hmm. yourself. Because the way I'm seeing it going is, you know, my concern is that I don't want you to 
you know, burnout. burn out or, you know, the burden to, to fall too heavily on your shoulders. And, you know, because I, I want to see this organization grow and succeed because it's so important at the minute, given that the spotlight is on the mental health stigma for so many reasons that I'd want this to keep going and help more no, people. I, I, I do know that we do definitely need to get more help. We have got um, uh, counsellors and things now, and a couple actually offer their services for nothing, which good. is good. I mean, ones that we do, we do pay. Mm. Um, but ideally, like, me and Liam here were talking about this actually, because of his friend that I can openly talk about, because Chris has shared his story very publicly that we've helped him. But um, I would love to have a, kind of, a drop-in house for emergencies, but that's way, they, they started that's way one, down the line. You know, they started yeah. with one and now they've got four or five, yeah. um, purely because, you know, the unfortunate suicide rate in Ireland is, is, is way too high. You know, majority among men, unfortunately. Um, and these centres have helped hundreds of thousands of people, you know, saved hundreds of thousands of lives. But they started out with one residence in Dublin, you know, with a drop in with a few uh, psychiatrists here and there. And it's just, you know, grown into but such a big entity. But one of the main things that I want for back on side, I think it will be a few years down the line, and I don't even know if it is possible, but just now, for instance, um, it's not supposed to be, but my phone is a 24 hour crisis line. Yeah. Crisis line. So, um, I will, if somebody phones and see they're on a bridge or about to jump in front of a train or whatever, yes, it's automatically phone the police. But then yeah. I'll, I'll still go. You'll still stay on the line and yeah. then go and, and um, help. And I've, I've done that a few times and I work really closely with the police now. If I actually, if I phone and I see who they are, they have got, um, obviously, record and they respond really quickly. They're really good. Yeah. Um, but police I would, Scotland have been, you know, they've... Yeah. Like, from what I've uh, from what I've heard, I don't think I've heard a bad word from from people about the response to things like that. It's quite rapid. And, yeah, no, it's you know, and, it does help when you have that kind of service available. And they're really good with them. Um, so there's a few times I've actually had to go into a station and tell someone's on the phone yeah. to me, where we don't know who they are, but I have to be the person that's trying to get it out of them. And yeah. the police, they are. They look at me at sometimes yeah. because they're just they're kind of sitting there going right, yeah, where's he, where's, not, where's um, and then they'll they'll, they'll yeah, shoot off because they don't have a lot of training in mental health either, which is. It's a shame, yeah. but um, so yeah. So I, one of the things further down the line about a five year plan is um, for back on side to have a, a proper crisis team, not just me. Yeah. So but it's not. You say it's like a, a it may never happen, but that's that's not something that's too far fetched in my eyes. I mean, that's I something not, that that's something that's very doable. Yeah. You know, when you have the right people involved. Me personally, I can I can definitely see that happening. And I hope it does happen mm -hmm. to have a, a crisis team, even a voluntary crisis team that's there, you know, and takes, again, takes a bit of the yeah. burden off you because that's so many you're doing everything. So, yeah, because just know. now, I mean, I've seen police and heard that they've, I mean, they've sat in hospitals for, for hours with, mm -hmm. with patients um, and then they'll end up getting sent home or. So that's, that's time that we've taken police off, yeah. off the streets for. Whereas a crisis response team, for example, could, could come in be, and. Because uh -huh. and, and there's quite a few times I've sat with people um, throughout the night, uh, throughout the day, while they're waiting to get assessed and be seen and then, yeah. and then fought for the, be, being that voice for them to yeah. to be heard, if that makes sense, and then be kept in uh, overnight. Yeah. So to be able to do that and, and release police or not, because there's nothing more stressful than... Knowing that already, these guys can be out yeah. helping another, you know, also help if you're, save another life. If you're at a stage in your life where you think that all you, all your worth is not to be here, and then all of a sudden the police rock up and arrest you. There's, I, I can't even imagine. Yeah. Think what that would be like. And the yeah. only reason it's happening is, of course, to yes. keep them there. It's to keep them safe you know, and to keep, keep them protected. And yeah. Um. So to have somebody else step in and and take that away and and have that safe space for someone. Then that's something that I would love for back on city to be able to do. We do we do it just now, or I do it just now yeah. as much as I can. But <laughs> it does have a it does have an impact on me as well because it's it's heartbreaking to to see some of the situations that people are in. Yeah. Um, and I just want to take them home. And I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's um, why you need that that <laughs> home to be able to to give them that yeah. safe space. You know, what I mean, sometimes having a total stranger in a room with you is better than having someone that you know because mm -hmm. you're talking to someone who. You've never met, and, never and sometimes that's easier, and you're not going to get judged because they don't, you know, they don't know you. Because I know what it's like. I mean, I've, I've got a lot that I still need to tell my family. Yeah. Um, 
And it's not because I'm not close to them or anything. It's because I'm, I'm protecting them because I know how they'll feel. Exactly. I, I was in the same boat. Again, my, my parents didn't know till about two years ago. And again, I know I've said it time and time again, but my life only started at 28. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm 31. I've only had really three years of living my life. And when I told my parents, I was afraid of how they would feel. But at the same time, it was a massive weight off my shoulders. And they took it so, so well. You know, I wasn't expecting the response that I did get. But I know how, how tough and hard it is to, you know, just sit them down and tell them. You know what I mean? It's. I know. I'm, my dad's old school. He's a farmer, so he's very old school. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he, he's very behind me. What mm-hmm. I'm doing because Good. in farming as well, the, the suicide rate is unbelievable. It's probably higher than in a lot of um, industries. But again, it's not. Uh, it's not, it's not spoken it. about because people no. go. Ah, he's it's, constantly it's on just farmers. Yeah. yeah, but you know, this is something back on site. Obviously, can can. Look, look to in the future it's mm-hmm. not just you know right now you've got the kind of grip on sport and football and rugby and things like that and all it takes is branching out to one organisation to say look there's, a, there's something mm-hmm. wrong here and we want to help but where did the name come up from I'm just intrigued back on site where where did you think right this is going to be the name of my organisation I'm going to uh, you know put this banner on it <laughs> <laughs> it was like, um, off site and get people back on the right side and mm-hmm. um, I think it was actually Barry Ferguson that kind of swung the idea about back on site. Hopefully he's not copyright. No, no, no. no. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was it was all based about Jack doing, like dropping out of football and trying to bring the football into it. Because the part of the school programmes that we do is three hours in the classroom and an hour out the football pitch mm. and getting them to bring what they've learned in the classroom out to the pitch with a player and getting them back on site. So That's good. Um, but it's not it's not just football, it's about getting people's lives back on the side on the right side. Yeah. Good. Where we should be. Good. Um, so yeah. yeah. Well before before we finish, um I, w- I do want to give a shout out to Cal. Obviously I've never met him, you know, I am I'm, I'm looking forward to, to meeting him, you know, at some stage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I'm looking forward to meeting him uh, hopefully early next year, um, to pop down to him and that. But uh He's been he's been quite the character. He's he's a he's a lovely lad. He's, yes. he's he's been through so much, but to know he's still here, you know, it, it it's all down to to your help, and, and I'm sure he knows that and appreciates that. But you know, Cal's story is something that he's you know probably yeah. spoken about a little bit. Um, he's, yeah, he's only touch base, and and one day he will he yeah. wants to very openly talk about his story. Of course. Um, we we have or have shared quite a bit about Cal, but that's with. With his request, of course, um, because it help it helps him as well. He, because he's he's in a hospital where he doesn't see friends or family very often. Um, he doesn't. He now has just got his social media back, but again, not full time. Yeah. So he needs to still feel that he's not forgotten about, which is a huge yeah. thing for someone going through that in a mm-hmm. in a place where it's secure. Um, but no, he's Cal now is like. He's like my second son. He's, <laughs> he was born the same day as my daughter. All oh, right. Uh, there's ten, eight minutes between them. Wow. Um, there you go. <laughs> so, so yeah, there's yeah, there's a huge bond between us. And as I said to you earlier, that and Cal will quite openly share this as well. We had a, I had a, a lot of experiences with Cal, like very heartbreaking um, times with him. But one in particular where he was on the phone to me, and I thought we we're going to lose him, and yeah. it was. It will stay with me forever, and it has made a bond not just with him, but me with his family as well. I now feel part of their family. I've been yeah. welcomed as part of their family. And it's something very special. It, is, it doesn't yeah. happen often, but you know, it's it's something special. That, I mean, they've they've obviously taken you in as one of their own. Mm-hmm. But surely, for what you've done for Cal, it's to them, it's priceless. You know, I mean, you can't. You can't put a price on that, you yeah. know, what you've done for him. <clears throat> and I don't look at it that way. I just look at it as that, um, yes, he's just like another son. Yeah. And he always will be. And, and you, I mean, I, I do. I'm going to be shy because he is a GKB <laughs> shy. Uh, and we have arguments and disagreements. And <laughs> as any parent would. phone down on me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we don't speak for a couple of days. And, and then he'll apologise. Well, I'll apologise yeah. to whoever's not the stubborn. <laughs> But yeah, no, like he is, he's very, very special and and he's got another six months maybe in, in hostel in Essex 
but he's doing well and he's he's coming on a lot better than what he was. And I'm actually going to see him this Friday, so I'm Good. looking forward to that because I've not been able to get down and see him for a while. Uh, it's been a busy time for you. Yeah. you know, it's totally understandable. You've had a lot with yeah. back on side and things like that. I, I for one, can't wait to meet him. Obviously, it's he's a massive he's hips a massive fan. Hips fan. And... I mean, he got a, he got a tattoo <laughs> just to wind me up. There you go. I mean, it's um, just and he, every card he sends me or every text message he always puts that uh, horrible glory, glory date that the, we don't want to remember. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so you know, he's, yeah. he's a great big guy, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing him. I've not seen him for a couple of months, mm. so um, you're good to get back down and yeah, no, it will be. Catch up um, he's getting some um, unescorted leave this time, wow. so we'll just be out, two of us together. So I don't know what we'll get up to. Amazing, we'll, we'll have some fun, I'm sure. <laughs> but yeah, no, he'd be pleased to hear that you've given him a shout out, and he's looking forward to coming to Hibs. Um, the guys have promised him well, to do some you know, training and stuff. Cliff yeah. and Keith are always talking about him. Um, I don't know if he'd want him on Hibs TV talking because he just, <laughs> he's very passionate about Hibs. Do you know what? It, it doesn't matter. If he, if he comes up the Easter Road, we'll, you know, yeah. it's open arms from, from myself and, and the media team and everyone at the club. Do you know what I mean? To have him up there would be a massive step, not just yeah. for him, but for you and for his family and everyone. So hopefully he'll be able to make that trip at some point soon. Very yeah, soon. I mean, hopefully he'll start getting some home beef soon, mm -hmm. um, which means he can come away from the hospital. Yeah. And I'm, I know for a fact that one of them wants to come up here just to see him. So, yeah, um, no, that's understandable. <laughs> he, he does. It, to be honest, he uses what you guys have offered to do as a, a focus, mm. and that's one of his main focuses. Is yeah. set so I'm gonna, targets. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get yeah. there. Yeah. That's his kind of his aim. No, definitely. Yeah. Um, Hibs have been fantastic with him, which is which is great. Yeah. And you've got a partnership with they've got a partnership with exactly. Backside. Working with the exactly. youth, youth teams and under 18s and even younger than that again. Mm -hmm. So, no, Libby, you've been an absolute gem, you know. To, um, Thank you very much. <laughs> I've done that compliment thing that I can't even deal with now. I'm just like, oh, <laughs> no, you've been fantastic and we really appreciate you, you know, no, speaking you about your much. stories and, and how it all began. Um, but if you're listening um, for the first time, if you're listening, you know, down the line, if you're going through anything at all, if there's any problems that you do have, please contact uh, back on site, um, but not all at once because you know there's only one phone number. Um, but please do contact the necessary people because if you're going through anything at all, um, I know that I say this all the time. The hardest thing is to talk about it, but the best thing you can do is talk about it. Even if um, I've said this to a lot of people as well, that aren't like my numbers there, and if you don't want to talk, just text. Mm -hmm. Just text me. Well, there you go. You can text as well, yeah. which is fantastic. So from us, um, and after the 90, uh, it's been a conversation with Libby Emerson on Back On Side. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.